Nice to see you, Lee. Given the timing of this budget as a springboard for an election, how can any voter trust that it's about what's genuinely best for the nation rather than what's best to get the Liberal Party re-elected? Because what you've seen in tonight's budget is a dramatic and material improvement to the bottom line, as we've banked, actually, the vast majority of those revenue upgrades. Uh, and we, as a result, we see the deficit more than halving over the forward F estimates. We see the uh, we see debt also peaking earlier and lower. And then we've provided cost of living relief, which is really important to Australian families right now. This is the number one topic of discussion around the kitchen table. And we've done it in a practical, in a temporary, and in a targeted way. Uh, halving the fuel excise, providing the $250 payments to pensioners, veterans, carers, and others on income support, a $420 boost to the low and middle income tax offset that will go to more than 10 million working Australians, and cheaper medicines and access for both concession and con non-concession card holders. These are very practical. These are very responsible measures that respond to people's needs. Well, you're giving, as you mentioned, voters $250 each within the next few weeks, uh, by total coincidence, time to land in the middle of an election campaign, when your own budget papers note that household disposable income has increased by 11% during the pandemic, why is any further handout needed when many people have banked savings during the past two years? Well, when you speak to pensioners, when you speak to veterans, carers and others on income support, you know that the cost of living pressures are biting. Now, you've also got an indexation arrangement um, to the pension, which has seen a single pensioner receive more than $20 additional a fortnight from March. Uh, that will put over a six-month period around $260 into their pockets. And then tonight, we're boosting that with $250. Again, that is reflective of the challenges that they face. But, but I point what, out to what? you that the low and middle income tax offset actually doesn't get into people's pockets till after the 1st of July, and that's after the election. So uh, you, you can't have it both ways. Treasurer, what's contributing to cost of living is inflation and so therefore you have to be careful to not do things that are going to make inflation worse. How is it responsible to pump up government spending in an economy where inflation is a serious risk? Well, because these measures are very considered and they're temporary, they're targeted and they're responsible. And if you look at our fuel excise cut, uh, which will deliver to an Australian family with two cars who fill up once a week about $30, uh, and then if they, over a six-month period, about $700, that actually, according to Treasury, reduces inflation by about a quarter of a percent. So that's a result of cutting the fuel excise. So we've got the balance right. That's what we've sought to do uh, with temporary measures that go to the heart of people's needs. But Treasury is also warning in the budget papers that the combination of higher global inflation and mm. an historically tight labour market suggest that domestic inflation risks are tilted to the upside. So they're worried mm -hmm. inflation could get worse. Yet the actual forecast has inflation declining over the forward estimates. What's the basis for your optimism that from next year inflation will trend downwards? Well, you're right that they lift inflation this year. And again, that's largely driven by those international events, not just the oil price, but the supply chain disruptions, which have seen freight costs increase by five times since the start of the pandemic. You've also seen wheat costs up 40 per cent since uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So that's flowing through. But then Treasury see inflation moderating from four and a quarter per cent this year to um, three per cent uh, next year. And they point out that the wages price index as an indicator of wages growth is above inflation, which is good news uh, for working Australians. But wages, uh, you know, every budget I've covered, wages forecasts have been over-optimistic compared to what's actually happened. You're highly optimistic that low unemployment is going to fuel wage increases, but Treasury is warning that we've all already seen the unemployment rate fall faster and lower than expected without generating substantial pay rises. Why do you think that's going to change? Well, I wouldn't want to correct you, but I have to. Um, in last year's budget, I forecast wages uh, that would end up, ended up being lower than what was delivered. They were half a percentage point higher than what I delivered in than what I forecast in last year's budget. But you so can't, actually, Treasury, you can't Treasury... dispute that over, say, 20 years, there have been a lot of forecasts that we're going to see wage rises and then they've just stayed flat. Well, you're pointing then to the Labor Party's record as well, and I welcome well, that. You've but, been in power the, for nine years. Come on. But but the re but the record is this: that we are now heading to the lowest unemployment rate in some 50 years. Yeah, but I'm wondering and, why you think that's going to drive wage increases when it hasn't so far. For two reasons. Um, firstly, it's just 
um, follows that when you've got a tighter labour market and employers are competing for workers, that that will put upward pressure. And secondly, there's another uh, wages indicator, which is called AENA, which I announced in the National Accounts, which was at 3.3% uh, in, the, in the December quarter, which will then, is expected in these documents to rise to 5% by, by the June quarter. Now, that's a broader indicator of what wages and earnings, more importantly, earnings are happening across the economy. That's pointing to upward pressure. So but as more people get into work, we'll see upward pressure on wages. But if, if business is going well and there's earnings, what you're banking on is that businesses are going to be able to well, they're going to pay better wages because there's fewer workers because unemployment's low. But yeah. businesses at the same time, even if they've got good earnings, their supply costs, their transport costs are all going up. So yeah. where is the money going to come from to give workers uh, additional wages when they're trying to meet very substantially increased supply costs? Well, again, employers will pay what they need to, to get the right workers. And you can only pay what fact, you've got, right? But, but as, what we are seeing is a very strong economic recovery and what we've encouraged in this budget is more uh, relief for small businesses with partic two particular measures to drive uh, their adoption of digital technologies, to drive their skilling of their workforce. What we've got is more infrastructure programs to support growth, particularly in our regions, all of which is going to drive a stronger economy where businesses are not just more productive and competitive, but they're also more profitable. And that gives them the opportunity to take on more workers, to pay them higher wages, especially when right now the biggest issue facing businesses is workforce shortages. You've mentioned the cut to the fuel excise a few times. You've said that it'll be removed in six months. Is that timing simply a dirty bomb set for Labor if it wins the election? You, you'll turn around in six months' time and then blame them for a sudden increase in petrol prices? No, it responds to the here and now uh, where you've seen uh, petrol prices above $2 a litre and it's been largely driven by the events overseas with a barrel of oil up by 50% since the start of this year. But also in the budget, Treasury have forecast that the price of a barrel of oil will come down to around $100 uh, in the September quarter and it's on the 28th of September that we pivot off that cut in the, uh, in the fuel excise back to where it normally was. And what I've made very clear in my budget speech tonight is that the cut in the fuel excise is not coming at the cost of investments in roads. We're still committing $12 billion over the year to, to, to new road funding, which is very important and which is where normal fuel excise revenues go. We've had a situation where the market, you know, oil prices are greater, so therefore petrol prices are greater. So the market is potentially driving people out of uh, petrol cars because they think, oh, geez, maybe mm. I should move to an electric <laughs> car faster, right? Because petrol yeah. is so expensive. But what you've done is now distort the market because you've made petrol cars go back to being cheaper and you've changed people's focus perhaps from electric cars, which is supposedly what your renewable vehicles policy would aim to do. I think that's a long bow if I've ever heard one. This is a temporary targeted six month cut in the excise reflecting the challenges that Australian families face. And we know um, that people are voting with their feet and taking up electric vehicles and we're investing in the charging facilities so that we can see more electric vehicles roll out. But this is a cost of living uh, pressure that is hitting hard on households budgets. We've listened to them, we've acted, and you've seen that result in the budget tonight. On infrastructure spending, you've emphasised 11 national projects in your publicity documents, and a number of them are in areas where there are critical seats in play. So Central and North Queensland, Tasmania, uh, the Hunter, the Northern Territory. The Auditor General's previously said that the granting of projects to politically desirable areas is a big problem in both sides of politics. How can people trust that these are the most worthy projects out there, not just the best pork barrels on election eve? Well, I think one of the more exciting aspects of this budget is our investments in the new economic frontiers. Those areas of our country, those re the regions in our country, which will supercharge growth and jobs and capitalise on what is a growing middle class in the region. So we're focused on the Northern Territory, it's called Middle Arm around Darwin. We're focusing on uh, Central and Northern Queensland around the Burdekin and we're also investing in Hell's Gate. The Pilbara is well known for its iron ore and of course it's good port facilities, but it's got great potential as well as an energy hub, as an export uh, hub for more, than, for more than resources. And then of course the Hunter as well, which is a well-known region in New South Wales, we're investing 
existing in there. So we've got a very substantial regional package. It's more than just infrastructure projects. It's also investing in skilling, in regional universities, in modern manufacturing and recycling, as well as substantial health uh, programs to encourage more doctors into the regions, for example, greater access to MRIs, uh, as well as a substantial telecommunications package for our regions because we know how important it is uh, for, for people in the regions to be digitally connected. But are you telling me it's just coincidence that so many of those projects have landed in areas and seats that you really need to either win or hang on to to win the election? Well, by definition, regional Australia is largely held in coalition hands. Um, that's a fact. And we know that regional Australia uh, provides more than two thirds of Australia's uh, exports and in, in goods. And that is, you know, a, a dramatic, a very significant asset for our country. So we want to further invest in these regional areas, Lee, because we need those new frontiers of economic activity. If we're going to be able to significantly, substantially enlarge our economy so that can pay for those essential services like aged care, like the NDIS, like mental health, like hospital and school funding, which is, of course, you know, priorities for us. When Labor was in power, I mentioned to Andrew Proven mm. earlier, the maximum their spending ever hit was 25.9% of GDP. And we all remember the Coalition was screaming blue murder about how irresponsible that was. The Coalition's now well above that and staying there. You said in your speech tonight, when Labor starts spending, they simply can't stop. Was that a typo? Was it, shouldn't it have been Liberals? <laughs> well, what the, the Labor Party does is not only do they don't stop spending, but they also increase taxes. And what you've seen during this pandemic is Labor commit to more than $80 billion of additional spending. When I ended JobKeeper, they said no, they wanted it to keep going. When we said to bring to the end the COVID disaster payment, they wanted to keep going. We ended those temporary measures. It was the right thing to do. It allowed the economy to stabilise. But there's no secret, Lee, we are facing increased pressures for funding on aged care, on the NDIS and for defence and national security. Yeah, but you didn't, you so we've taken those steps. You weren't acknowledging those pressures when the other side was in government. I'd point out to you as well that if you have a look um, at the size of the deficit uh, for this mm. year versus next year, it's 79.8 billion and then next year it goes to 78 billion. So really you're not making any inroads there over the next 12 months at all. Well, I think a very important take out of the budget is that we're seeing a more than $100 billion improvement by the end of the forward estimates. That's to the bottom line, because what we have done is banked the dividend of a strong economy. Three quarters of those improvements to the revenue side have actually been delivered because more people are in work and fewer people in welfare. Unlike Labor, we haven't baked in high um, extended commodity price assumptions. We've been a lot more responsible. Our measures are targeted and there is a very strong story of improvement across the forward estimates where deficit as a percentage of the economy actually fall by more than half. You've always been honest that you'd like a shot at being the party's next leader, but if Scott Morrison loses the election, aren't you irrevocably tied to that loss because it's your budget that he's relying on to launch the campaign? Well, obviously, I'm you know, uh, focusing on winning the next election, but I'm very proud of the fact that Australia's economic recovery now leads the world. In the United States, there are millions of fewer people in the workforce than at the start of the pandemic. In Australia, there are 375,000 more people in work than at the start of the pandemic. Unlike the 80s and the 90s recessions under Labor, where the unemployment rate stayed elevated for some for a decade, we've actually reduced the unemployment rate below when we came to government. And the Labor Party said the single biggest test for our government's management of this recession would be what happens to jobs and unemployment. When they left office, it was 5.7%. Today, it's 4%. In the budget, we've printed 3.75%. So we stand every day of the week on our jobs record, but more importantly than our record is our plan for the future, which is laid out in tonight's budget. Treasurer, thanks for your time tonight. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 7.30's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.